This is the second time I've tried to film this video in about a two hour span because the first time I filmed it, uh, the construction workers working directly below me were making so much noise that they ruined every single take. And when I say I started freaking out, I mean, I, I, I was freaking out. So it seems to have passed. We're gonna try this again. I have seven books to get through and you know, they're still down there. I can hear them. There's just no drills going on. So we'll try to get through this as fast as I can. So wish me luck. The first book I wanna talk about was definitely my favorite book that I read this month. And that's A Dream of a Woman by Casey Plett. This is a book that seeks to center trans women in morally and emotionally gray situations. And that's what I loved about this book because I think it's so easy for cisgendered people, white people, men specifically, I think to pick up books about people, cultures that are different than them and think that the book is giving them this like generalizable knowledge of the other. And I think Casey Platt wrote this collection, at least in part to illustrate the fact that Trans person is not some like monolith and everyone is the same. Some are good, some are bad, some make good choices, some make bad choices, some are morally wonderful and some are morally repugnant and they're people. Just as an example, there's a story called Hazel and Christopher and Hazel and Christopher were best friends when they were boys. Hazel transitions as she gets older and, and, and she's not close with Christopher anymore. Once she has transitioned, she meets Christopher again, both as adults and she's really nervous of like, how is this gonna change their dynamic? Can they still be friends? Will he wanna be in her life? And she's overjoyed at the fact that not only does Christopher still wanna be in her life, they become romantically involved. But then eventually Christopher realizes that he's been harboring similar thoughts his whole life and he wants to transition as well. And Hazel is pissed about this. She's not happy about what's happened because she has found Christopher again and they love each other and she just wants to love him. And because Christopher chooses to transition, they're not going to be together anymore. And not only is she gonna lose that love, she is gonna be forced to become almost this mentor for Christopher. It just dramatically changes the nature of their relationship and she just, she's like, I, I'm, I, I don't wanna be your teacher. I want it to be your lover. And she just doesn't sugarcoat how much that situation just personally sucks for her, even though she wants to be supportive. She's been in that situation before, but she wants to be supportive and she just, she finds it really hard. There's another story called Perfect Places where a trans woman goes out on a date with a guy she meets online. She's really nervous. She's afraid of how it's gonna go. She's really nervous that, that this guy is just gonna use her almost as a fetish. And she's relieved when it seems to be going really well. They go home, they're getting intimate. And you know while they're having sex, he starts to confess some things to her. And by the end of them having sex together, he is wearing a diaper and he's, basically getting her to play the mommy role in this fantasy for him. And I thought it was such an interesting idea because it really plays with this idea of being the, you know, receptor to undesirability and then being the perceiver of undesirability. This collection more broadly is about, I think, that feeling you get when you grow older and you realize that not only are other people going to disappoint you, but you as a grown person with wants and needs and desires and choices, you are going to disappoint other people. And I think it's a book that can be appreciated by trans and non-trans people alike, because I think it's about those moments again and again and again in each of these stories, these painful moments when you realize that you are not living up to the version of you that other people expect you to be. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It is so good. Next is Things I Have Withheld by Kai Miller. This is a book of essays, which is something I don't really read all that often. I picked it up kind of on a whim while I was visiting a bookstore while I was back home on vacation a couple of weeks ago. And it's a book that really tries to explore, I think, the silences around racism and what it means to be in those silences and what it means when you break those silences, what it means to take that risk. And I think those risks or discussion around those risks are what I found most fascinating about this book because I think there are risks involved with speaking out and there are risks involved personally with staying silent. And I think 
it was it's really important as a white person to read this book and kind of ask yourself what does a person lose when they're not allowed to use their voice and even if they are allowed to use their voice what do they lose if they even feel like they're not allowed to use their voice if you notice a slight camera shift here it's because my camera or my phone fell over no Fuck. and i hate when that happens because <laughs> it's such a small thing but then you try to line it up again and it's not quite right and it just drives me crazy i'm having a very frustrating day okay so going back to that last point uh the most important question i think you should ask is what does a person or what can a person lose when they actually do use that voice. Kai Miller is a black Jamaican queer man who lives in England. And uh, a lot of this book is written as kind of quasi letters to two of his heroes, uh, James Baldwin and Kenyan writer, Binyuranga Wainaina. It's this beautiful kind of narrative device that I think gives the book like an entirely added layer of, of power and emotion and meaning. But because of the connection he has, most specifically, I think, to James Baldwin, it adds a layer of history and tragedy and sadness to the whole thing. It's an incredibly affecting book, though. It's, it's really quite good. Next is a book that I think has gotten better and more interesting in my own brain the longer and further I get from it, and that is Hex by Rebecca Dinnerstein Knight. This is a book that's set at Columbia University, and our narrator, Nell is obsessed with poison and plants and also her literary advisor, Joan. The book is written in kind of these like love letters from Nell to Joan as their professional and personal lives become kind of intertwined. And on top of that, there are just grudges and obsessions going every which way. It's a book about desire and ambition and university campuses and attractions and scandals and heartbreak and mostly it's about unrequited love and what that feeling can do to a person and that's kind of where i sat with this book when i finished reading it and i, and I kind of talked about this on instagram that was essentially how i summed it up but the longer i've sat with it it's been like almost a month i think since i've read that book and I'm just, I'm thinking more and more deeply about it all the time. More specifically, the connection between Nell's love of poison and antidotes and her obsessions around Joan. And specifically with her love for Joan, I found it kind of interesting in hindsight how Nell finds it so obviously unrequited. She knows it's unrealistic. She knows nothing is going to happen. Joan is kind of this unreachable person for her and yet she cannot help it. She has this desire for her she can't control. So thinking about this desire she can't control has just become more and more interesting to me. And desire that you can't control is a theme I've really kind of been hitting on over the last couple of months and it's become really interesting to me. So I think in hindsight, this book has come to mean more to me kind of very curiously. Something I've been fascinated about has been the fact that Nell kind of fears her own desire sometimes. There's a quote in here where she says, what if you're wrong about the thing you think you want? But at the same time, she never kind of apologizes for wanting what she wants. She doesn't think that what she wants is wrong. The wanting isn't evil, but it might be poisonous to you. And it's this connection I think between her love of Joan and her love of poisons has that's become really interesting the more I've thought about it because she doesn't see her kind of unrequited love or her desire she can't control as something that's not necessarily bad it's just harmful for her and poisons are very naturally occurring in the world they're not bad or evil but they're very harmful for you poison is biology it's a part of life. It's just not a good part of life. Okay, I'm losing light really fast, so I'm gonna have to fly through these last few. The next one is Master and Commander by Patrick O'Brien. This is a series that I've been told to read by a good friend of mine for over a decade, but the, the sheer length of it, I think it's up to 21 novels by the end of it. Um, the sheer length of it has really um, dissuaded me for so long, because, especially because you know the two main characters, Aubrey and Maturin, they make it through the whole series. And there's something to me about like a series that, that it's that long, it's about these specific two people, and they're both in it the entire time. 
which just naturally to me feels like, I don't know, it, it just feels like there can't be that much change that's going on. Uh, or how different can book 20 feel to book three if it's just these same two guys all the time? So that's the thing that's that's really held me back from reading it. But I was visiting um, family on the East Coast a couple of weeks ago and, you know, I'm walking on wharfs and I'm by the ocean and I'm just was inspired by the water. I'm in the mood for something nautical. Let's give it a go. And I've really, really liked it. It was more readable than I thought it was going to be. Aubrey uh, was a much more interesting protagonist than I thought he was going to be. Now, that being said, I don't think I'm going to keep going with the series just because it is so long. And it, or if I if I do continue reading it, it's just going to be a very plodding, slow process that I'm going to read over like 20 years. I wasn't hooked on it enough that I'm going to read them in succession. There's just there's just no way I can't do that with books I love. And this is a book that I, I quite liked, but I didn't like it nearly enough to, to dedicate that much of my life to that being said, if you love nautical books, you love books on ships, uh, you like kind of, you know, buddy cop, <laughs> buddy romance type books. I think you'd really like this book. It's, it is quite good. I had, a, I had a lovely time with it. But just The problem is that there's just, there's just too many books out there to read that you just want to read. How could you dedicate 21 of them to this same series with the same two characters? I just, I just, I don't know how anyone can do that. Next is a book that connects to a video I made a couple of videos ago, if you remember. Uh, my friend Simon came on here and recommended me a book. Uh, on Simon's blog, he does something where a couple times a year, he will do a reading project around a certain year. So it'll be like the 1923 project, the 1956 project, where everyone reads books from that specific year. And in September or October, it was the 1976 project. So I thought I would participate in this for the first time, and I read a pretty unconventional book, I think, for this. The Acts of King Arthur and His Noble Knights by John Steinbeck. Yes, John Steinbeck wrote a Arthurian Legends book, and I don't know anyone who knows that. I didn't either until I saw it in a used bookshop a couple of months ago. I thought, I thought it was just the most fascinating, weird career turn. It turns out it was never really finished. He was writing this uh, over a number of years towards the end of his career, and it just kind of petered out and it stopped and this book was published as like a collection of what he had written posthumously. Specifically, this was Steinbeck's attempt at modernizing Thomas Mallory's The Mort Arthur. Steinbeck's book includes seven Arthurian tales, five of which are uh, Merlin, uh, Morgan Le Fay, Merlin's Death, The Wedding of King Arthur, and The Knight of Two Swords. And then two of the stories are more lengthy ones and they center on Sir Lancelot and Gowan, the Green Knight. And I think the book is just Steinbeck's attempt at putting into words, one, why these stories meant so much to him as a kid, and two, why they maintained a level of import to him even into his like later years. It's really, really good. I love this book a lot, and I only wish he got to finish it the way that he wanted it finished. That being said, it doesn't need to be a completed book. The way that Arthurian tales are normally told, this fits in no problem. You don't need a beginning, middle, and end. Next, I read a classic, Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence. I did this in preparation for reading the novel Tenderness by Alison McLeod, and that's a recent publication, and it is about the writing of Lady Chatterley's Lover, the trial that was meant to suppress it, and then the men and women who fought for its publication. So before I read that book, I wanted to read the source material, so I read Lady Chatterley's Lover for the first time. For those that don't know, it's a story about a woman who instigates a sexual relationship with her gamekeeper after her husband suffers some injuries after fighting the war. Because this is about infidelity and it's about a woman committing infidelity, this is one of the most banned books of all time. But what I found just really fascinating about it was not a, not not the kind of the sexual impropriety. What I really liked was the discussion of of class because she's not just cheating on her husband, she's cheating on her husband with someone way lower on the social ladder than her. Now what's really interesting about this book is that Frida Lawrence, D.H. Lawrence's wife, famously left her professor husband to run away with D.H. Lawrence. So what I found fascinating about this was that he spent basically his last days on Earth. This was his last book that he ever published. He spent his last days writing a book, I think mostly about 
her experience, but through kind of his eyes. So this is really a book about whether a woman can, I think, reinvigorate herself, find herself, maybe even like rekindle her sense of self through sex. And the fact that that's happening in a book that's, you know, nearly a hundred years old at this point is, is pr quite beautiful. I, yeah, I would recommend it. If you're a big classics person, uh, I don't think you'd want to miss this one. And finally, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this one because one, I don't have a lot to say about it. And two, I think other people just have a lot more worthwhile things to say than I do. And that's about Bewilderment by Richard Powers. Now, sorry for the pun, but I was a bit bewildered by this novel. And maybe not even this novel. I'm a bit bewildered by how people respond to this novel. This is a book that not only was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, uh, my friend Jill, the book bully here on BookTube, recently called it perhaps a perfect novel. And in both cases, I just, I do not get it. I just, I just don't understand it. It reminded me of the really disappointing reading experience I had with Sophie's World, which the idea around that book was to take a lot of different philosophical concepts and rather than like put them into a textbook, try to explain them through a narrative format. So it's basically taking a philosophy textbook and turning it into a novel. With Bewilderment, I found that Richard Powers was doing that with astronomy. He had all these interesting environmental and astronomical concepts that he wanted to talk about and didn't want to do it in like essay format. So he put it into a novel and I just found it obvious that that's what he was doing. A lot of people seem to find this novel really affecting, really touching, really beautiful. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> okay, I, I, I just don't. Full disclosure, I was reading this while I was on the tail end of my vacation back home and I was really not happy to be there. I really wanted to leave. So I was not in a good headspace while I was reading this book. And I think that's important to disclose if you don't like a book. But at the same time, were there enough interesting nuggets in there that I would read it again thinking I short shifted it? No, I just I just have no desire to read this book again. And it's fine, like if people, if people love it, more power to you, good for you. I just, I just did not have that experience with it. I just, I just, I don't get it. And I'll point out, it's not because it has a child narrator. A lot of the people I know who haven't really loved it uh, seems to hinge on the fact that they don't like child narrators. Or not even narrators, but like precocious young children who are very, very smart for their age. I actually don't hate that trope at all. And I've thought about making a video um, kind of in defense of the intelligent child narrator. Yeah, that wasn't it for me. I, I, I don't mind smart children in books. Um, I just didn't find the concept or the plot or the characters interesting. Thank you so much for watching. As always, my name is Rick. I hope you had a great reading month of October and that your November is going just as well or even better. Let's be positive, even better. And I will talk to you all in a couple days. Bye.